Welcome to the Support Raising Solutions podcast, where we help new and current ministry workers grow in being spiritually healthy, vision-driven, and fully funded Great Commission workers. Welcome everyone to the SRS podcast. I'm your host today, Callie Davis, part of the SRS core team, and I am delighted to be joined again by the lovely ladies. We have Alice Atkins and Emery Silva from Inner Varsity. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Thanks Thank for having me, you, Callie. This is delightful. So Alice Atkins is joining us. She works with Inner Varsity and has been for the last 19 years and has just an incredibly diverse background. Born in the Philippines to Hong Kong parents, moved to the U.S. and is currently living in Amsterdam, of all places. She is the Associate National Director of Asian American Ministries. And I have loved hearing you on our podcast earlier, just the wealth of stories and experience you bring working across multiple cultures with staff who are raising support, your own support raising experience. So I'm very blessed to have you join us again today. And then Emery, also from InterVarsity, has been with them for 24 years, has worked on campus with students, has been a support raising coach now on the national MPD leadership team that is Ministry Partner Development. She's the Associate Director of MPD. And Emery, a little bit of the reverse of Alice, instead of having kind of grown up in the U.S. and living overseas, Emery is Dutch and living in the U.S. They're joining us today to kind of continue the conversation we started several episodes ago about support raising being cross-cultural. And we unpacked a little bit about indirect communication then. And that's what we want to dive into a little bit further about communication styles and direct versus indirect and why that's important when it comes to talking to people, sharing about ministry and inviting them to partner with us. So maybe a good place to start with is maybe resharing some definitions of direct and indirect communication. I don't know how familiar our audience is with that. Yeah. So um, I think to start, you know, just to name that, you know, the creation of MPD um, was largely influenced by like the Western business models, which mm-hmm. use direct communication. Um, and, that, you know, that a lot of those white people um, the face of missions today is a lot more diverse, praise God. And so it's just helpful to understand that some cultures tend to be more direct, like that Western business model, and some tend to be more indirect. Um, so to do a refresher, um, I think it's helpful to think of communication on the spectrum of indirect to direct with lots of potential stopping points in the middle. Um, we were talking last time about how you know, indirect communication can seem more confusing to direct, pe- direct communicators. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to think of direct communication as like a black and white movie and indirect communication is like technicolor. (laughs) There's just so many Mm -hmm. dynamics. It's so rich. Uh, It's been fun for me to learn more about. Um, So some cultures tend to be more indirect. Asian, Latino, and native tend to be more indirect and others are more direct like black culture and white American culture. These are broad generalizations, um, lots of exceptions within it. And someone who's Asian American, for instance, is probably more direct than someone who lives in Asia, for example. But someone who's first generation, born in Asia and then immigrated to America, is more indirect than someone who's third generation, born in America and raised in America. Um, But what is indirect communication? Alice, you wanna do your definition? Yeah, last week we defined it as, you know, direct communication focuses on the words and its meaning. Mm -hmm. It's like really straightforward. Intentions are clearly stated. The onus is on the speaker to make himself clear. Indirect communication in its technicolorness includes nonverbal, such as body language, gestures, facial expression, and phrasing, inflections, vocabulary choice, social status, even the context all of these could change a meaning of a word um, and even silence has a meaning. So what's interesting in indirect communication is the onus is on the hearer to make sure they receive uh, the communication clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of an interesting, um, so it's not, the onus is not upon the speaker to make it super clear. Uh, one other piece is that as a white person, it helps me to understand indir- indirect communications connection to honor shame cultures. So honor shame cultures are more communal. 
And the emphasis is on bringing honor to the family or the group and avoiding shame, which is called saving face. This is really important to people in an indirect culture that they don't shame their family, friends, or community. Um, as a mostly direct communicator myself, I operate with more of an individualism mindset, um, but I'm aware that there's just multiple dynamics involved with indirect communication. So to notice, okay, there's group orientation, individualistic orientation, all of that affects how we communicate. Mm-hmm. And I would encourage even probably the, the more micro, you talked about indirect and direct being on a scale. I think we've been talking about the big buckets of kind of where you can really clearly see some differences, but looking even more micro or kind of those small variations, you can look at a community, maybe like a city community or like everyone in your school, everyone in your church, and you'll still find these subtle variations. What I loved is we painted a picture last episode about being kind of focused on who you're talking to, focused on the donor, on the partner, and how will they receive this communication? So this is so valuable, even if you don't feel like you're crossing a lot of cultural barriers, because if you actually pause and you're thinking through, okay, wait, how has, how have I communicated with this person in our long history, short history? How have I seen them communicate? What is kind of their context that I, at least as far as I'm aware of, okay, therefore, how can I best approach this person? And that can be varied even in a smaller kind of context, a smaller uh, pool of people that you feel very homogenous. Every person's a little different. Their family influences right. their yep. communication style, their experience, their the jobs they've been a part of. So it's probably easiest for us to talk about some of those bigger um changes because it makes it a little more apparent, but this is so applicable to everyone. It's about, I think it's really about seeing, really seeing who you're talking to and caring about them and letting that influence how you communicate. Yeah. Yeah. In um, first Corinthians nine, um, the apostle Paul talks about um, changing himself to become like the people Mm. he was trying to reach. So I think that's, very similar in MPD, like how do we shift who we are? Not, not the core of who we are, not the gospel centeredness of who we are, but how do we change our approach um, so that we can reach more people? Absolutely. I love that. It's not that I need to be a different person. It's, I want to be aware of what barriers are there for you to fully hear the vision of what I'm telling you to fully hear this God invitation I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to remove those barriers so that we can communicate so relationally. And I would say understanding the spectrum of direct and indirect communication and growing in how to apply it is a really valuable skill in doing that. Yeah. I love that you said the word here too, Kelly, because it reminds me of a training. You know, we do a bunch of trainings in university around um, raising support. And so, um, there are certain folks who just like very direct communicators, they literally will not hear the ask if it's not delivered in a direct mm-hmm. way. And so we, you know, there's times that we coach our staff, like you aren't being a direct enough, you, you aren't being direct enough. So that you, the person can't hear your ask. You've got to be more direct with this person. But then I was leading a training and I have some scripts in there that are for direct communicators and some that are for indirect communicators. And I had one of my very indirect staff members, um, you know, I have them read the scripts when we're, you know, in, off, off the PowerPoint for the group. And she read it and it was an indirect script. And she said, oh my gosh, I feel like that was so direct. Because for her, it was so direct. It was almost too direct, even though I thought it was indirect, you know? So it's just, there is such a spectrum Mm -hmm. of what people, how to help people hear, you know, and how to meet them where they're at, like you said. Yeah. Well, do y'all have some examples? I, I know we've kind of been talking in descriptive terms, but let's bring it down to earth. What does it sound like? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked. So um, there's many versions of an indirect ask. This is not a like, here's a one size fits all. Of course not. Um, yeah. <laughs> like we were just saying, you know, it depends on how indirect the person is. And, you know, the men- person I just mentioned, she's a native Pacific Islander staff, but she's on the more indirect spectrum, you know, of the native staff I know, for instance. So, you know, there may be other staff who live in the same island as her and they're just not quite as indirect. So, you know, Alice and I mentioned in our last podcast, 
time with you that we um, are offering a training. People can sign up. There'll be a link in the show notes to just give some tools about how to understand the donor and kind of nail down a little more of their communication style. Um, we can't do all of that today, but I'm going to give some examples of what the asks are on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, so an indirect ask in general is one in which you're giving the donor a way to save face, a way to avoid shame. You're giving them an out um, because them saying no directly, if they can't give, would bring shame on them. And so there's different ways to do that depending on who they, they are. Um, okay, so I'm going to start on the spectrum. If you can, in your mind, all our listeners, if they can picture on the left side of our spectrum, we have the most direct approaches. And then on the far right side, we have the most indirect. And we're going to talk about six different asks within that spectrum. So our first one on the very far left, our direct ask this is our bread and butter ask. I'm going to encourage staff when they make the financial ask, they're going to ask for a dollar amount. So they're going to use a slideshow. We have this carefully practiced presentation and the presentation shows their passion for the ministry. They tell good stories. They talk about the need. They talk about the strategy. They ask for prayer and they ask the partner, the prospective partner to give. And they have a giving chart. So they see, you know, you can give $50 a month, $300 a month, whatever. Um, They're supposed to assess the donor ahead of time and then ask for a specific amount. Like, Callie, would you consider giving $100 a month to reach students for Christ on this campus? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of our bread and butter direct ask. Um, Sometimes staff are shy about this approach, not because the donors are indirect, because they're scared. And so we work through those fears, you know, so that's our bread and butter. So let's take it one step less direct than that. We're going to move from the far left to a little bit more to the right. A face-to-face ask without a dollar amount. So if we have this donor who's a little bit indirect, we could shift the approach and they could do all the same things going through that same slideshow and talking about the ministry. But instead of asking, would you give $100 a month? The fundraiser shows a gift chart with their budget and some examples of giving levels and says, would you consider joining at a certain level? Like, would you consider joining as a sustaining partner? You know, you have like a few levels of giving that are grouped, you know, with a name, like sustaining level, leadership level. Um, it's a little more indirect because the fundraiser is putting a few options in front of the donor and they're both looking at the chart rather mm-hmm. than looking at each other. Yeah. And the donor might give the, the staff, sorry, could give the donor space to consider and say, you know, I'll follow up with you by text, email or call. And actually, mm-hmm. I think this is a good place for Alice to talk about um, follow up with an indirect ask too. Yeah, I mean, if I'm doing this ask like to a really close friend who's Asian American, but is a little more indirect, um, I would be very sort of careful that I make sure they know that I'm going to do a follow up. Mm. Um, because I think in certain cultures, uh, in indirect culture, last week I said silence also has a meaning, right? Mm. Uh, so if they're not expecting a follow up call, then if you're sort of put them in, uh, in an awkward situation of like, they were actually going to give you a no by not replying, but now you've sort of awkwardly put them in a position um, of, of having to reply unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. So I do think that that's one way, whereas when we, you're doing a little more indirect, you, you have to make sure, hey, make clear how and when you're going to follow up, right? And so that they can so that they can be prepared Mm -hmm. to do it in a way that's not sort of embarrassing to them or to you. Mm -hmm. Right. So whether it's like, Oh, you mentioned that, you know, I can be on your prayer team. I, I would love to do that. You know, then I would not press them. So will you give me the money? Mm -hmm. Right. That was the, that was sort of like the indirect no. Um, So that's, I think really key. um, If you're from an indirect culture, and you are going to do a follow-up, make sure it's very clear because in some ways you are sort of breaking a cultural rule of putting someone, making someone reply. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing it over email, it feels a little less direct or over text, Mm -hmm. but it's still good to be very clear. I will follow up and I will ask you. Mm -hmm. So I joke that ghosting was actually like perfected a long time ago by indirect culture. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) actually a way to say no. It's a proper way to say no, but not putting shame on anyone. You just sort of. (laughs) Um, Okay. So our next step of, you know, maybe someone's more indirect than that. Um, So 
what, this is a strategy that some of my native Pacific Islander staff like to use. They still make the face-to-face -face asks. Honestly, those face-to-face -face asks could take a lot longer than mine do. Like I usually schedule somewhere between half an hour and an hour to have an MPD appointment, but I have these staff who are spending like two to four hours with their partners because relationships so important. Mm -hmm. They'll talk about their ministry. They'll mention they have financial e needs. They might even show the gift chart, but they won't ask them to choose a level, but they will definitely follow up you know, with an email, with giving links. One staff is sending a Google form that I, I worked on it with her. And it, the Google form itself is very direct mm -hmm. because that part is online. It's not as much in their face. It's easier to be direct there. Um, and then it, like Alice said, it has options for prayer and volunteering, um, which also helps with saving face, but also because sometimes, at least in this community, indigenous communities, they're so serious about prayer. I think, you know, they put people like me to shame and how much they're praying yeah. and, you know, giving up their time. So that's a step more indirect. We're going to take it another step indirect. Let's say in, in this, um, now we're kind of halfway through our continuum. We've got an email strategy. Um, so I coached a man, um, he's a senior manager in InterVarsity, he's Chinese American. And the way he did it is he started this email campaign where he was asking his people to increase their giving. So he sent out a mass email first to let his donors know that he was in a fundraising season. And then he sent like different segments of people an email to ask them to pray about his need for increased funding. And then he met with individuals um, for appointments and did some face-to-face -face meetings, but he didn't ask them directly. He just said, you know, I talked about the ministry and need for support generally. And then he followed up. So this man in one month raised $40,000 from his Chinese church networks um, because that was what worked for them. Um, so that was, you know, a beautiful example of someone who knew his community and knew how to do it well. Um, and then my most indirect on this spectrum would be group asks. So I mentioned this story a bit in the last podcast. Um, a woman who grew up in Hong Kong and she did her direct asks here, but then when she went back to Hong Kong, she visited small groups. Her pastor set it up for her. He said, you know, please welcome this young woman to your small group meetings. She went to the women's ministry, the men's ministry, this small group, that small group. And she presented her ministry. She didn't ask anyone, you know, very directly to give. I mean, she might've said, I need support. And then she, the pastor followed up after her to say, please support this young woman. And then she did a bunch of email, you know, individual emails. And um, she was able to raise all her support and get on campus in the fall. So it was, it was really sweet. Um, Alice, actually, you've done this kind of ask with the aunties in your church. Do you want to yeah. elaborate I mean, a little bit more? At my church, I would have, you know, go to Sunday schools or go to the aunties and uncles, like ask the most social auntie to throw uh, a, a little hangout. They have amazing food. I do an ask presentation. I even show like, here's a gift chart. And then and then I would follow up by um, by either emailing them or sometimes I don't even, I just hand them like my case with a BRE in it. Mm -hmm. So in a very indirect ask by just handing a BR, like a business reply envelope mm -hmm. to, to send money back to your organization, that already in itself is the ask. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember, this is totally to your indirect, yeah. you know, the very indirect people. Again, we're, we want to emphasis, it's donor centric. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, me as a fundraiser centric, you know, if it was up to me, I would do it like that all the time, <laughs> you know, but then that's not what, yeah. Uh, we're called to as Christians. So the one thing I want to say is like, just because you're from an indirect culture, it doesn't mean you're never direct, right? Mm -hmm. My yeah. father, he fundraises $900,000 a year for his organization. He does ask his close inner friends directly, but no money, no money amount, right? Um, and then I had to ask directly to my advocates, will mm -hmm. you support me this way, right? So there is work involved. And sometimes the work is even more hidden. Mm -hmm. Right. And it could be harder work, but it's not, it's just where you put sort of the direct asks. Right. And yeah. so, yeah, so that's, and then other ways to do this, my father does banquets, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. With matching grants. Um, and so, you know, mm -hmm. that's another way that's been done. Uh, if you want to do a group ask, it just depends on, you know, your community and you have to know them well. Yeah. And I would say over all this, I mean, obviously there's no one size fits all. Um, 
And hopefully people are hearing too that most of our staff have to do a variety, like at least most of our staff of color, I would say who have a lot of, who are part of a community that's indirect. They do indirect asks, but they also do very direct asks because, you know, they have a bunch of different people in their networks and they're not usually all one community. Sometimes they are, but usually they're not. And so it's a skill of learning who is this person again, what's the best way to ask them. And then also practicing, you know, doing some that are going to feel oh my gosh, this feels so direct. Like, you know, this yep. staff that I mentioned who, earlier in the podcast who felt so like even the indirect script felt direct to her. Well, when she's, when I'm coaching her to, you know, talk to people who are very like white direct people, like she's got to be direct, even though it's going to feel yep. hard for her and I'm going to support her in that. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're a person of color and you have to do that, it does take a lot of energy, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So definitely have people praying for you, supporters, you're talking it through with your coach and then also afterwards debrief it with someone because you're, you're breaking sort of inner cultural rules. That's been sort of like jammed into you all your life. Right. So I remember like, okay, these students who are my alumni from a chapter I staffed, you know, white men. Okay. I'm going to ask, are you going to give $150 a month? Pause drink my water it's really <laughs> awkward you know and it worked but inside I was dying the best example I can give from an American culture it's like if I told a man hey you actually need to go to that lady and tell her her she's fat oh man. right oh, right yeah. there's yeah. like <gasps> what do you mean I'm breaking all cultural rules mm-hmm. right but then you're like, that's the truth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Go tell her, right? You're like, oh, oh dear Lord. <laughs> right? So that's my best example of how it feels mm-hmm. cross-culturally, right? Because in America, that's a cultural rule. It's not a rule in other places. Like in the New of Europe, there's like fat sections for clothes, <laughs> right? Is that weird? I'm like, oh. But it is a cultural rule. Mm-hmm. And so, so I do think, you know, as a listener... If you're someone from indoor culture and you have to go direct, get some support mm. and debrief it afterwards because you're going to feel, I mean, for me, even though I've learned to do it well, there's always still a little like, <gasps> okay, you know, but, you know, we, we are loving people. We are speaking their language of love, you know, in terms of when we like to talk about love languages. So, yeah. yeah. I think I want to point out in the examples you gave, there was a variety of ways to invite someone to partner, but there were some things that were consistent. You still were very much connecting with the person as relationally as possible. And you were still communicating that you had financial need. Yeah. And that is really important. And I think a key part of why any ask is effective. Um, It really was just that, invitation to respond that someone you're asking them to make a decision that is where i saw just those that difference there still though was god is doing something you can be a part of it i have a financial need and and then it was like really that last final piece yeah. that there was some variation yeah and i think the other thing you're kind of saying it too but in each of them there's you have to share what the mission is about you mm-hmm. know your excitement about the mission your vision for the mission you know your hopes for it you know you if in any of those situations, if the person doesn't share their dreams, you know, and their excitement and their sense of here's what God is doing, it's going to fall flat. And that, you know, crosses, I think all boundaries. (laughs) I don't think that that's culture specific. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and also just one more thought. I'm remembering Alice, when you talked about follow-up, it very much sounded like you had a plan and you communicated that plan and it wasn't, it wasn't just flying by the seat of your pants of, I think this is indirect and, or I suddenly mm-hmm. feel more awkward. We will go to plan W. Um, but no, you've put some thought, you've made a plan. Here's how you're going to communicate this. Well, here's how you're going to follow it up to be appropriate with how you asked this. This isn't just fly the by the seat of your pants. Yeah. And I tell my Asian American staff, if you don't think ahead about follow-up and you're thinking about it right then and there, or when you actually go to follow-up after you say your ask, you're too late. You've already created an awkward situation, you know? So you do have to think ahead, but that's because I am thinking through my culture and I'm loving my culture Mm -hmm. and I am honoring this person. Right. So it does take some, it does take some foresight and thought because 
in those situations, it's like, so I think that's a lot of indirect ask. The mm -hmm. reason they don't follow up is because they, they never set it up mm -hmm. to be able to follow up. And then it gets awkward because, because, you know, a no could not replying could be a no. So you're like, ah. Yeah. So then yeah. I would say, remember, there's all those other options too of like emailing. Mm -hmm. And I've even as a supervisor have done this where I'm like, you can use me as an excuse. Mm -hmm. Say, I'm sorry, but my supervisor is making me follow up with all the people I have. <laughs> and I have to give a report to my organization. So the shame is put on the organization mm -hmm. and this amorphous supervisor um, for why you're breaking a cultural rule. So mm -hmm. that's another sort of little tip. If, yeah. um, if you didn't think ahead and it's already too late, um, one way to do it is to say, hey, you know, they're requiring me to, you know, check up on all my ass. I'm, I'm so sorry I didn't, you know, Mm -hmm. If I've caught you in a bad time, yeah. can you tell me what you, how you would like to partner with me, you know, whether by prayer, by financial support or by volunteer. Mm -hmm. So that makes it less. You know. That's great. Absolutely. I think um, that is something about indirect asks is that it, I mean, I think any ask should take some planning. Like that's a way we care for our donors <laughs> is to plan for them. Right. Yeah. And then for indirect asks, I think there's a bit more planning, you know, because it's that, you know, what level of indirect am I going to be? And how do I follow up well? And how do I keep on it? And, and I'll say, you know, the burden isn't just for staff of color to figure this out. I mean, as a white person, I've, when I've done um, asks of my friends who are indirect, like I've really tried to think through what is the best way. And I've taken the different factors that Alice and I will talk about, you know, people want to go to our training um, into consideration. And the other thing that we talked about last episode that I want to remind people again is having a cultural informant is so helpful. So in those situations, mm -hmm. you know, I have these two situations I remember clearly where I was approaching an Asian American man and I, um, I called up another colleague, um, Asian American man, my cultural informant. And I said, here's the situation I'm going to tell you, could you have a minute? Can you, can I tell you about this potential donor? I think this should be my approach. Can you please tell me if you think I'm on the right track? And that's just been really reassuring. And, um, and encouraging for me because mm -hmm. I, I want to honor my donors too as a white person and speak in their language. And, you know, in both those times, cases, it went really well. Um, so I think it, it, these are principles we can all um, mm -hmm. talk about. Um, one thing we wanted to talk about is, you know, it can be tempting to be like, this is just too complicated. I'm just going to ignore communication styles and just going to yeah. do my thing. And mm -hmm. we wanted to touch a little bit on what happens um, in those situations. So, um, Alice, do you want to share your story about um, the Asian American staff um, who had a hard time with her alumni? Yeah, so the Asian American staff, she's brand new. Her coach had told her, like, put, you know, like, on your letter, make sure you do a very direct ask. And these are not a lot. She's in a new school, so she doesn't know the alumni. Mm -hmm. So that means in, in the Asian culture, it's like farther out from you. And so you have to be even more indirect. And so the way she wrote her letter and the way she asked, uh, one of the alumni came back and was like, that was not good. You should not have done that. You know, so she was like, yeah, she was like shamed in front of like all these Asian American alumni that she, that it wasn't in front, but he was, he was trying to help her. Mm -hmm. Right. But it was still like, oof, right. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, and it wasn't the end of the world. You know, the Lord is is good and he redeems the things we do and we lean upon that. But it would also be helpful if, you know, she had gotten a little more instruction in mm -hmm. that like, oh, since you don't really know these people, mm -hmm. the letter itself is already an ask. And by putting so much detail and so much numbers, you're almost like crossing the line of, mm -hmm. of you know, being sort of too direct and so yeah that's an example of what could happen oh. yeah that was hard mm -hmm. I have an example too I, I was um hanging out with this couple this white couple they're actually they were going with a different org not university to um to East Asia and um they asked me for support which is fine and then um after that they were like can we debrief a situation with you that we we had we just didn't because they knew I was a coach mm -hmm. and so um they were like, we asked this Chinese American man, um, 
this professor for support and we could never get to the ask and we couldn't figure it out. It was like the weirdest ask ever. And so they were, I was like, well, tell me about it. And so they said, well, we kept trying to talk. We told him about the ministry and he wanted to hear about the ministry. But then when we tried to get to the part where we asked him for support, he kept changing the subject. It was the strangest thing. And, you know, he wouldn't let us actually ask him. And I was like, well, tell me about this man. And they were like, well, he's a professor. He's older. And I was like, well, when did he immigrate? He's a really recent immigrant. How well do you know him? Not very well. Um, where were you meeting with him? At the university. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you guys, <laughs> he's an indirect communicator. You just didn't, you know, no one trained you in that. So it's not your fault, but he's an indirect communicator. He was trying to save face. What you need to do now is just send them an email with your giving link in, you know, in the body of it and you're done. But, you know, they, this man was sort of trying to protect them from yeah. making a mistake. And it, it was, I felt kind of bad for everybody. I felt bad for the professor and for my, you know, the couple in my living room. And so when you understand some of these dynamics, you know, it gets better. But mm -hmm. I think in both these instances, if there had been a cultural informant, mm -hmm. It could have gone differently, both for the donor to feel on donors, I guess, in both cases to feel honored in, and for the mm -hmm. fundraiser analysis story um, would have been a different kind of outcome. I'm curious. Those are two examples of not being indirect enough. Mm -hmm. What happens if we ignore communication and we're not direct enough? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> How many stories have I about that one? <laughs> I mean, that is one of my frustrations to be honest, Callie, um, when I see staff, you know, hide behind it, like mm. they'll say to me, Emery, I chickened out, you know, I didn't do an ask or I did a really indirect ask. And so sometimes I'll say, I think you need to go back. And, you know, like if we assess and that one is, they really should have been more direct, you know, I'll say, why don't you go back? Why don't you go back and ask in a different way, you know, or can you send a follow up, you know, an email to make a clear ask? Cause I mean, usually what happens is they don't either get a gift or they don't get as big of a gift. And, mm -hmm. you know, if someone's chronically doing that, then we just, we hadn't have to hit the pause button and do a skills training um, mm -hmm. because there's a skill gap that they're missing. Yeah. Which, I mean, that sounds like a, a really hard thing to navigate. You don't want to be too direct. You don't want to be too indirect. I'm going to guess people are never going to get it right every single time. I think that what happens when we see so many people succeed. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in this program that I lead for veteran staff, we see so many people flourish. I think it's helping people find their groove, you know, mm -hmm. and if you can help people figure out how to do the ask in the way that works for most of their culture, mm -hmm. you know, and they get some confidence and they see this does work mm -hmm. and they start to raise significant money. You know, there's a shift that I think happens mm -hmm. where people, um, they be go from being kind of amateurs to like, maybe not experts, but the in between of like, oh, I can do this. And I think I understand it. And then they start to even know, I need to go back to my coach to ask about this situation, mm -hmm. but I know how to do that one, you know, and that's yeah. the beautiful thing. That's when we see people succeed and get to their full support and, and it's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's why the man that I talked about who raised $40,000, that senior manager, he knew his culture really well. You know, he knew what to do. All I really had to do was support him in it mm -hmm. um, because he already had the expertise Honestly, what he just needed was the accountability and the time to do it. Mm -hmm. From a pastoral perspective um, to your question, Callie, I think the way I think about it is like, we're often in application, we're often like a drunk man on a horse. We fall off on one end or the other end too much. <laughs> and so I do think if you fall on the end of like, I don't pay attention to any culture. I'm a one size fits all, you know, then I'm like, yes, please start figuring out all the ask. Please trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're someone who's actually trying hard to figure out how to ask and, and you're doing the work, Mm -hmm. Right. But then you've hit the other end of like, I'm just paranoid. that I'm going to make a mistake and I'm frozen and I can't, you know, I feel guilty. You know, then you need to think about, yes, you need to live into the grace of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You need to believe that God can fix any mistake you, you can make. Right. Mm -hmm. And that like, um, yeah, that's something I sometimes tell myself as a, you know, perfectionist. It's like, there's nothing I can do that the Lord can't fix. Now we're not <laughs> asking you to like, you know, it's like that drunk man on a horse. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're not saying just don't do any of it. Right. But we're also, if, if you're like paralyzed by it and you are trying, mm -hmm. then I think it's sort of like, you need to talk with Jesus about like, what is, what is at the center of that and what is catching you and to do some of it still, but to not 
make it sort of like you're not you're never gonna ask anyone yeah. in a direct culture because it's like wah, you know and and honestly I've gone through certain grid you know the, our grid and there's been some people that are just different mm-hmm. you know they just don't fit sort of like the you know what is sort of like the cultural norm right mm-hmm. and that's okay and and so that's one caveat I have is like when we're generalizing not everybody fits mm-hmm. sort of like this is a way for us to ha- describe it. So it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Yes. So it's not saying like, if you are this, you have to be this. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like a guide. So I do feel, yeah, in that way, w- we don't want it to be also, you know, paralyzing to people, mm-hmm. but it is also that we need to think about it. It's really important. And yeah. We believe it's part of being in the kingdom is to see all our diversity in our unity. Amen. Well, and I think that is such a good message to kind of wrap up with as that reminder. Thank you so much, Alice. It is the Lord who goes before us. It is the Lord who is preparing all these partnerships, all these conversations. If it was based on our ability to convince someone to give us money, there would be no success. Maybe one person out there randomly who's a really good car salesman. Um, not me, definitely. <laughs> uh, it's, it is so much about what God is doing and he chooses to use us. Hallelujah. Um, so I, I think I was a perfectionist when I started raising support. It took me a long time to learn I would not do everything perfectly. There have been times I have gone back to partners to apologize, to re-ask when I just mm-hmm. completely demolished it the first time. And, but it was, I went back, I worked through not always knowing how to communicate well, because, because at least the one thing I did get was that it was so important that they hear what God was doing and have an opportunity to respond And so, yeah, it's something that it took time and practice and coaching to grow through, to do it better, to do it more effectively for who I was reaching out to. And that's okay. That is, it is a process. It is a journey and there is so much grace uh, because the Lord has a much bigger plan and uh, we, we thankfully just get to follow in his wake. Yeah. I think that indirect and direct asks, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like cooking, you know, it's an art and a science, like you can Mm. follow the recipe, you know, on the cookbook, but then you start to, you know, innovate and you're like, I like a little more cinnamon here, or, you know, I put a little more olive oil there, or I, you know, you start to make it your own. And I think that's support raising too, that, you know, as we get into it, I mean, the stories that Alice and I both shared are newer staff, people who are new to support raising, you know, they hadn't maybe figured out how to make a casserole yet, but as as you keep doing support raising and you figure out, you know, this is the way that my community responds to me asking for support. It gets easier and it can actually be really fun too and really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you, Alice and Emery so much for joining me again today. It's been a delight to kind of dive into this topic. And I know we probably barely scratched the surface of it, to be honest, but hopefully it's cast a little vision for our listeners for how they can grow and maybe give some new ideas that the ask doesn't always look like the same five words, six words, eight words, um, but instead really look to who you're talking to, to communicate effectively for them. So listeners, thank you for joining us. We hope this has been an encouraging and helpful time. And we hope you come back again and listen to future or past episodes, especially if you missed the previous episode with Alice and Emery, casting kind of some vision and unpacking why support raising is cross-cultural. So I hope you heard that. If not, please go back and listen and have a great day. Thanks for joining us today, and please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode as we work to give more insight into building and maintaining your ministry partnership team.